Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, let's get started right away. Um, I was introduced beautifully. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michiel Rook. I'm a, a consultant from the Netherlands. Um, and some of you who were here last year uh, may have seen my talk on continuous deployment uh, at a, a, a local Dutch shop. And um, I did this talk, uh, so last year here at Riga and um, uh, in a bunch of other places. And typically when I talk about continuous delivery, continuous deployment, people come up after uh, and ask, uh, okay, how do you deal with databases in such a situation? Um, and that basically inspired this talk because when you talk about continuous deployment and the project I was talking about ended up doing about 50 plus deployments per day, um, which uh, as Ken uh, correctly s described is not a, a goal in itself, but it's where we ended up being uh, and it definitely fit the business there. Um, and we were dealing with uh, databases, but also with high available, uh, highly available systems. Um, and those databases frequently had some sort of migration going on. Um, and when you do 50 plus deployments per day and a bunch of ma migrations potentially per day on a highly available system, which is supposed to be running almost 24 seven, uh, not completely, but almost, um, how do we do database migrations and um, avoid downtime? That's what triggered this talk. And we're going to go right uh, into the matter here. Uh, this is uh, pretty technical, um, but that's okay. This talk is all about database schema migrations. And so it's mostly about relational databases, uh, your Postgres, your Oracle, MySQL, what have you. Um, so when we talk about database schema migrations, obviously we first need to define or talk about a database schema. And when people talk about database schemas, when I talk about schemas, we typically refer to, uh, to something like this. You know, you have your uh, your uh, slightly uh, uh, verbose view on, on your data model, but this is typically what, what you see when you have a relational data model, um, especially if it's grown organically for a few years. Um, when you write that down as SQL, um, this is what it could look like, right? It's just a bunch of SQL statements. And those statement, statements together um, define uh, the schema or the, the data model of your database or databases, right? So now let's assume we haven't done everything perfectly and we need to change our model at some point in time. And this is where database schema migration comes in. And those migrations are typically defined again in terms of simple SQL statements. And the way uh, we define them is we have a direction called up or forward, uh, which is a SQL statement which changes the database schema from the version we have now to the version we want to go, so version n plus one, right? Um, in this particular example, we create uh, an address table which just is going to contain uh, street names uh, or addresses. Typically, those migrations, depending on the tooling you use, depending on the, on the terminology you use, also know the down or reverse or back direction, which is where we essentially unroll or roll back the change we just did if the change were to fail. Uh, now, not all tools support this, and I'll get back on this in a little bit. Most of the database uh, schema migration tools that are out there um, execute these individual SQL statements in a transaction, which means they, if, they, uh, if they fail, uh, the transaction is not committed and the transaction can be rolled back and is undone. Uh, there's a whole bunch of tools in this arena uh, and I'm just going to mention a few of them. Um, there's, there's lots more than these, um, uh, vendor specific. These are mostly vendor agnostic uh, and um, all of them are at least in part open source. So that's good. The tool I'll be talking about today mostly, and that's just because that's my bias and the tool I end up using the most is called Flyway, which is a, a Java tool. And Flyway is um, a very simple tool in, as, in essence, and that's what makes it great, I think. Um, Flyway simply uh, describes in the basic mode uh, the database migration as a simple SQL script. 
That's all it is. Um, again, we write the create table statement there in a file which we uh, a prefix with a date or some other version string uh, so that we identify the version. And then Flyway on executing actually um, checks your database uh, against its current state and sees whether any migration scripts need to be applied. It does that by adding an, uh, an additional table to your database uh, called the schema history, where it records every single migration it has applied to your database uh, and records the status, uh, the date and time, uh, who ran it, how long did it, uh, did it take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is essentially the version table that allows Flyway to determine uh, the, the state, the version of your database at any point in time and see whether any migrations need to be applied or have already been applied. Now, one thing that's nice about Flyway is that you can install it midway in a project on a legacy application, which did not have any migrations beforehand. So uh, when you have an actual running database, a production database with a schema and data. And the thing is, uh, the way Flyway does this is we're going to save the initial schema, so the, the current schema of the database, as its initial state, as the first migration to run. And we're actually going to mark that as already having been executed because that's what the database is currently in, right? So uh, we have a snapshot of the existing database schema. We save that to a file and we store that as the version one or version zero, the, the, the uh, ground zero of your database essentially. And we mark it in Flyway as being the baseline. Do not execute this migration, but consider the database to be exactly compatible with this migration. So consider it to have been executed. So it marks it in the Flyway versioning table as being the baseline script and it has been executed. And of course, it took zero seconds because there was nothing to do. So this then sets your database in a state that you can add new migrations. And from that point on, you can uh, use Flyway and other tools have uh, similar systems for this. Another nice thing about Flyway is that you can do migrations repeatedly. So um, uh, if you want to uh, create a report or do some other select statement as part of a migration, or you want to refresh data or refresh a trigger or a view, you can do that as well. So it, it will execute migrations again and again. Um, of particular uh, interest is Java migration. So instead of writing uh, bare SQL files, you can write Java uh, scripts, which may uh, could take data from other sources or do some sort of analysis before they do the migration, which is also interesting. And third, you can do callbacks. Again, Java scripts, Java code, which is executed whenever a migration ex is successfully or unsuccessfully executed against the database. And then you can do something else. Now, when I talked about the up and the down direction of a database migration, I talked about the down direction not being supported by all tools, right? So when we talk about down, we are talking about undoing migrations. And um, Flyway does not support undo uh, in the basic form, in the open source form. Uh, if you buy the pro package, uh, and I'm not advocating this, but if you do, uh, then you get the undo form. But the nice thing about their documentation is they say, we do not recommend using this actually. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why. Because undoing has to do with uh, the bigger question of do we roll back or do we roll or fix forward? Right? And especially with databases, this is an interesting uh, discussion because consider um, destructive changes to your database. Uh, it is almost impossible, uh, other than restoring a backup, to uh, roll back uh, a column deletion. You cannot restore the column uh, unless you restore the backup. And especially if you have uh, 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 the backup is, is a few weeks old and data has since been added to the table, it's almost impossible to restore what would have been in that column that you just deleted. Um, but let's go deeper into destructive changes. Long-lived locks are uh, interesting. Uh, some databases lock tables entirely um, and, and this becomes a, a problem for uh, database migrations, especially if you uh, are adding data to it. Um, renaming. Um, is hard to um, restore or recover from. 
and deletion, like I just mentioned. Second, implicit commits. Uh, these days it's a little bit better, but especially MySQL suffered from the fact that uh, certain alter table statements triggered an implicit commit of the transaction. So whatever uh, transaction you were in, as soon as you did an alter table something, then that triggered an implicit commit. So the transaction you were in were actually, was actually committed and a new one was started, meaning it's difficult to uh, uh, restore the previous transaction. Now these days it's a little bit better. There's only a few alter table statements that trigger an implicit commit, um, but it's still something you need to be aware of. Third, if you ever do any sharding um, or distributed database setups where you have distributed transactions going on and you have a transaction or a migration that ran successfully in one database and it ran unsuccessfully in another database, then rolling that back is going to be a nightmare if it's possible at all. So uh, restoring from backups, I briefly touched on that. I don't think that's viable in a system that does not go down during the migration for the simple fact that um, if I delete something in a migration and the system is still uh, working and stuff is added to the table that just uh, saw a deleted column, for example, um, then the backup is going to be obsolete. It does not have that data. So you will have to record that in some sort of sh snapshot form. And if you then restore it, there will be a bunch of records that have no data for the column you deleted or have now restored. So that's difficult. So my personal view is, uh, especially in highly available systems uh, that rarely go down, that rollbacks uh, from a database point of view uh, are not feasible, not practical. Um, so a failed migration to me is essentially stuff that you need to clean up before you try again. Um, now downtime, that's another topic. Um, let's consider this very simple deployment flow. We have an app uh, and we build an image for that app. And once the image is built in our uh, CI server, uh, let's stop the running container, assuming it's Docker or stop the running image, assuming it's something else. And then we run our mig migration, so our app is down we can successfully run our migrations, and then we can start the system again and everything's fine. Uh, down, upshot of this is we have zero complexity in running the database migrations because we don't have to deal with a system that is uh, um, persisting data while we are migrating it. So that's cool. The downside of this is downtime. And the downtime may be as long as it takes for the migration to finish, which can be quite substantial. Now, continuous delivery. Um, continuous delivery uh, means code is always in a releasable state, right? So the moment somebody comes in and says, okay, now uh, I wanna release whatever we have to production um, and translating that to a pipeline, you would have a developer checking in some code, a CI server doing building and testing, uh, then uh, a process deploying that automatically to a staging or acceptance environment, for example, and then the red arrow indicating that somebody is going to push a button somewhere to deploy to production. Um, the projects I've been on for the most part in the last few years deal with continuous deployment, where we actually take out the human clicking the button and the moment we successfully deploy to staging or acceptance and we can automatically verify that that deployment succeeded, we have a bunch of checks, smoke tests, what have you, uh, we immediately uh, and definitively roll uh, to production. We roll that image to production, which is cool, but it has some consequences for the database migration scenario. Because consider the zero downtime deploy. Um, a 24 seven service, highly available, would typically be behind a load balancer, right? We have an app that is behind a load balancer serving traffic to the internet uh, or to uh, other systems, to other applications. And we have an app of V1, uh, 1.0, and we want to release app version two. Now, what we typically do uh, in, in such a scenario is add uh, or start version two of the, of the app, add it to the load balancer, uh, do some checks, and then let it serve traffic. And once it starts serving traffic, we can uh, discontinue app V1, we can remove it from the load balancer, and we can delete it. And if all goes well and we've done our work correctly, then nobody's going to notice that behind the load balancer, the app has been replaced by a new version. No downtime. 
very cool. But also no migrations. So if we want to do migrations, well, we definitely want to get rid of downtime. So let's talk about uh, what's the most important thing that keeps us from, from uh, being in a known downtime scenario, which is called the database state. And database state, when you look at, a, uh, at an application, again, the load balancer, app v1 behind the load balancer, but now the app connects to a database and it expects the database or the schema of the database to be in uh, a, a certain state. Um, namely, the state that the app was configured with once, once it was built. Um, which is cool, as long as we don't do anything to the database, uh, things will not break. But let's assume that uh, we run a migration um, and we bump the database to version two. Why did we do this? Well, we uh, want to run the new app version, app version two, that needs that new schema. So app version two expects the schema to be in the new version and app version one expects the schema to be in the old version. And because we want to have zero downtime deploys, there is a moment in time, however briefly, that both versions of the app will run and one of them will break and it will be the older version. It will expect the database state to be in a state which it's not anymore. So one of the rules uh, for database migrations in a CD scenario is that the old app should always work with the new database state. That allows us to always go one diff back or one build back rather. So you can do a git revert hat and push that. Um, and how do we get there? Well, we want to decouple the migration from the deployment. So rather than doing the code and the migration in the same thing, uh, we're going to actually decouple those. And we're going to introduce a few more steps or actually split it off in a few more steps. And the biggest thing or the, the most important thing about splitting those steps is that we always should do non-destructive changes. So we are always backwards and forwards compatible. And what are non-destructive changes when you look at um, uh, relational databases? Depending on the database engine you're looking at, it's adding tables, it's adding columns, so it's adding data, and it's adding indices. Um, the last one, depending on the database engine, uh, but usually these three are non-destructive and don't lock the database. So let's take a look at a concrete example. We want to rename a column. We made a typo or something else. We want to rename surname to last underscore name. It's not very difficult in, in, the, in its essence, but in a database migration, this can become uh, tricky, especially if the service has to stay up. So what we do first is we create a column with the new name. We don't actually rename anything, we just create a new column. So we create, uh, we add the last underscore name column to the table and note that it is nullable. The column is nullable. So that means that the initial, the entries for uh, this column for the entire table is null. And then we start writing to the old and the new columns. So if you have uh, an ORM or another entity uh, manager uh, type setup, um, it could look something like this. So instead of uh, just setting uh, surname, we also start setting last name. Or rather, uh, when we set last name uh, to retain backwards compatibil compatibility, we also set the surname column. So we write to the old and the new columns. Of course, we have to deal with the case that last name is still null because it's new. So some entries in our table uh, may still have last name set to null. So we have to deal with that case. If last name is filled, then we use that. Otherwise, we revert back to surname. And then we start migrating old records. Very simply put, we update every record in the table and set last name to the value of surname wherever last name wasn't previously set before, so where it's still null. Uh, this is a simple example, of course, so in, in, uh, in, in more complicated uh, systems or more complicated tables, you might have to do something with the last updated column, for example, but this is typically what it takes. Migrating the old records, and then we start reading from the new column. So instead of having that uh, uh, fallback to the old column, we actually can assume now that all the last names have been filled. And then we can remove the old column 
and code. And we can potentially alter the table to make the last name column uh, non-nullable again. Done. Not really, because there are some challenges that I want to take you through quickly. One of them is the long migration, the long running migration. Uh, large data sets, obviously, uh, but also when you need to select or populate data from other tables or other systems. Um, and some database engines lock tables or lock particular parts of data. Uh, there are ways around that, and uh, I'll show you uh, one trick in a little bit, but this is something that you need to be aware of. Another one is uh, my version of Murphy's Law, a database migration typically crashes at the very end. Um, so especially on long migrations, that can be a pain if it crashes at 99% and you have to restart it. Uh, but what if you can resume rather than restart? That would be, that would be awesome. Uh, memory usage is another uh, big thing, especially if uh, your migration causes the database to start writing uh, temporary tables, for example, and you either run out of disk space or memory. Um, something to be aware of. Cleaning up, removing old columns, removing old tables, leftovers, uh, locks that are, were still left over. That is something that you also need to do if you uh, rename a column and you don't remove the old column, then you're left with waste, essentially. Logging and progress. So it, it's annoying if your database migration fails at 99%, but you only see it was at 99% because it fails. Um, so some sort of logging to see where your migration is and how it's doing, how fast it is, or rather how slow. So monitoring, very, uh, very important there. And be mindful of nullable and non-nullable types. So um, I typically add the column, like I said, without constraints. So making it nullable, and then when I verify that all the data is in place, then I can add a constraint to make it non-nullable again. Now, a few strategies to deal with, these, uh, with some of these scenarios. And one nice one is, um, and I think this only applies to MySQL, uh, but I don't think Postgres locks in that way. Uh, I'm not sure about Oracle, is the lockless alter. You can force MySQL to actually not lock anything. And this is cool if you drop uh, an unused column, because in the default mode, uh, MySQL, at least uh, last I checked, will lock the table if you drop a column. Um, and if it's a large table, then that takes quite a while, but you can actually force it not to lock. This is um, not recommended by MySQL, I think, but uh, it is a trick that you can, can use if you are certain that the, the, the column is not used anymore. Otherwise, you uh, would get concurrency issues, potentially. But that is a trick to have in the book, one of many. Another trick, and this is a little bit more involved, uh, especially used if you do large-scale series migrations or database engine upgrades, so a new version of your MySQL or your Oracle or whatever, is uh, a replication strategy where we run the migration on a failover. So assuming we have uh, uh, a master-slave situation. Uh, we have um, a, a setup where you have uh, multiple replicas of, of the system. You have uh, essentially a cluster of your uh, databases. So let's assume we have a master and a slave, which both are at version 1.0 of our database schema. And the master is on the left, the slave is on the right. So what we do to uh, uh, perform this database migration is first take the slave out of rotation. We stop its synchronization thread, and at that point, it will start to fall behind. It will start to lag behind the master, right? But that's okay. Then we execute the uh, migration or the cleanup step that we wanted to execute, but that we can, could not do without the lock, for example. We execute that on the slave at which point the database schema bumps to the new version because we just executed that migration. Now, the important thing is here to use statement-based replication, not row-based, because you're going to uh, uh, remove potentially columns, and if you have uh, a row-based replication, MySQL expects the exact same schema on a master as on a slave, whereas if you do statement replication, it will only replicate the columns that it knows on the master and on the slave and will leave the rest untouched. So that's cool. We can then restart the sync thread and it will catch up, especially with statement-based replication. And at some point, we're back in sync 
However, the database schemas are now out of sync. So this is not something you want to have going on for a long time, but it's, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. What we then do is we actually trigger a failover and make the master the slave and vice versa. And we do the exact same tri trick on the left machine. So we stop the sync thread again, we alter the table, we let it catch up, and boom, both machines are in version 2.0. Um, the downside of this is, as you can see from the slides, this is very ops intensive. This requires somebody doing actual work behind the machine. A part of this is, uh, can be automated, uh, but you need to watch the machines and, and actually verify manually that this worked. Um, but in certain scenarios, this is a trick you could apply. It's not something you would uh, apply in all scenarios, but it's something uh, I think that you uh, can use in the, as a trick in the book. Another one is a tool called PT Online Schema Change. This is from Percona, and uh, it does not only work on Percona server, it also works on, uh, on straight MySQL or Maria servers. Um, and basically what PT Online Schema Change does, and there are many tools like it, um, it uses triggers to fill a temporary table while still allowing writes to the original table. And then it switches to the temporary table when the, the, uh, the copying has done or has finished. And then the temporary table becomes the new table. So what it does is it creates a shadow copy called the target table uh, of the right, uh, the right schema, the new schema, essentially. And then it adds triggers to the original table, so the table you're currently using, to forward any updates from the original table to the shadow table. And then it starts copying source data in small chunks, and it remembers where it left off, so it can resume if, you, uh, if it were to crash or, or killed. And once that is all done, uh, it will rename the target table to the name of the original table after the original table has been uh, destroyed, of course. Now, there are a few caveats here. Um, PT Online Schema Change does not do well with foreign keys, uh, simply because you cannot clone them. Uh, so you would have to first disable that. Uh, it can be very disk intensive, uh, and it can, um, especially on already overloaded cluster, it can cause serious performance issues. Um, but it's another trick in, in an ever-expanding book. And it would look or could look like this. So we have an alter statement. So this is the alter statement that we want to run. So that actually creates or is used to create the new shadow table. Um, and uh, the existing table that it runs is noted there. And there are a few additional tools that are similar. Um, the Large Hadron Migrator by SoundCloud. There's a, a something from Facebook and there's another table migration tool and there are more of these depending on the, uh, some of them are Ruby, some of them are Python. It very much depends on the language you're in, the environment you're in, the stack you're in. Uh, but they typically do much of the same thing. This is another tool that you can use, uh, and this is also relatively ops intensive. You need to watch uh, um, how it's doing uh, and, and help it if, uh, if, there are, if any issues occur. Okay, um, recapping just the last few minutes. So what is the important thing to take away here? Uh, database migrations in a zero downtime environment. It's all about planning, but mostly it's about multiple steps. So what you did before in a single step, namely the code plus the migration for that code, uh, we now split it off in multiple steps so that we don't do any breaking changes to our database. I do think we have a few moments for questions. If there are any, are there any questions that I could answer? I see that one in the back there. Just a second. Thank you. Uh, do you have any tips on uh, selling this uh, to management and developers? Because uh, introducing uh, the bigger flow will like 
we deploy applications in uh, one week instead of two days with a downtime. Like okay, uh, so the question is how do we sell uh, this strategy of doing multiple steps to management? Is that the question? Okay, well, if management is okay with uh, X downtime, where X is very much depending on the database migration, uh, the speed of your database, uh, and things like that, then yeah, you can choose for that. Uh, typically, the projects I've been in, downtime was only acceptable uh, in the middle of the night, and I dislike working in the middle of the night, and most people do. Uh, I do not think that is a sustainable pace, especially if you, do, if you have a rapid pace of innovation and you are forced, quote unquote, to do lots of changes to your database. Um, I would not want to be in a situation uh, where I have to be very careful about the database migrations that I need to do because I can only do them at night. That would make myself and my team be like, okay, let, let's keep that typo around because you know, the, the typo is fine where it is. Um, and I do not want to be in that situation. I want to be in a situation where, like continuous delivery, we can deploy the code or deploy the database in this case uh, whenever we want and when, whenever we need. So um, how do we sell this to management? Well, th and this is my, my Dutch rebellious nature, uh, do it. Um, I don't believe management has anything to say in that matter. This is a part of your, your uh, daily work, right? As a developer, as a, as a, as a database person. It, it may sound a little bit black and white, but that is my view about this. Hope that helps. Can I answer any other question? I have one there. Um, the first question will be, uh, um, you mentioned uh, you use the application and uh, version from uh, migration from one to two. Um, and also you are talking mostly about the database. Um, could you please mention the stack what you use in application? I will, exp I will make the second question after. Okay, well, the the, so the question is, can I describe the stack we're using? Well, uh, one of the projects I've been on that uses Flyway was a, a Java Spring Boot app. Okay. Um, so but I've also used Flyway in a PHP context, so it doesn't really matter, honestly. Okay. Then the second question will be, we used uh, database migration on the Rails, uh, Ruby on Rails application before. And um, do you know, based on your experience, what is the difference? And uh, so the reason why you're using separate external application to do the migrations from database to and do not use the tools provided by the, the framework. Okay, so the question is, uh, why do you use an external tool? Uh, well, if you And do if you have any uh, in terms of your stack data, uh, in terms of your stack uh, Java or the PHP? No, not, no, no real preference. Look, in, uh, if I do a Spring Boot app, then Flyway is integrated uh, automatically. Um, so, so you have that. But if you do Rails, for example, the uh, Large Hadron Migrator from SoundCloud is a Rails app. So it integrates directly with Active Record inside Rails. So if you want to do migrations within that scenario, then by all means, use that tool. Um, what I'm trying to say is there's, there's a plethora of tools out there that either run from the command line or are directly integrated in, in uh, Python or Ruby or Java. Uh, there's even a tool for PHP for that. Um, so it does not really matter. All the tools do roughly the same. Some are better, some are slightly less uh, uh, good. Um, they typically do the same thing. The most important takeaway is here, do it in multiple steps and don't br make breaking changes to, to your database. And honestly, that can even be done if you do manual SQL statements to your database, which I directly uh, uh, deny as having said, um, uh, don't do that. Um, but it's, it's not really about the tool. Does that help? Um, not, not really. really. <laughs> For example, in Ruby on Rails, you have migrations already as part of the package. And yeah. normally, uh, when you use any framework, uh, you don't have, uh, you shouldn't do any direct injections to the database because it's managed by the ORM. Or yeah. So then, uh, like I said, by all means, use the tooling provided by your framework if there is any. 
Uh, but the, the framework tooling does not actually preclude you from splitting the migration, which was previously breaking, into a non-breaking migration, right? Right. Okay, so thank oh. you. There was one in the back. Uh, at this moment, uh, I must uh, yes, say that uh, you will be able to ask uh, to Michael questions uh, before coffee break, basically during the coffee break. If yeah, I will be here the rest of today and tomorrow. So if you have any questions, then please feel free to approach me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.